so much for this time together. Lord, I just pray, please help us put the distractions out the door and focus on you. God, you are so good and so awesome to us. And I, I just pray as we finish this study today and we talk about this amazing race we're running with you, that we'll just be able to give you our full attention, Jesus, and take out what you have for each of us. Lord, thank you for the way you love us. In your precious name, amen. The fight I have fought, the race I have won, the faith I have kept. Sounds a little different, right? Second Timothy 4, 7. That is the Greek word order. And I like that a lot better because they put the nouns first. So, you know, you might hear Paul say, I have run the race, I have fought the good fight, I have kept the faith. And it, it looks like he's calling attention to himself. He wasn't. He wasn't. He was just kind of saying, mission accomplished. So the actual Greek word order of 2 Timothy 4, 7 is, the fight I have fought, the race I have won, the faith I have kept. So as we wind up our study on our end time survival guide, we're going to talk about this race we're in, this amazing race we're in. And, and I know that's a TV show. I've never watched it, but um, I saw the commercials. And when you win, you win a, a million dollars. But this amazing race we're in, we win in heaven when we see our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, face to face. So that's better than any amount of millions of dollars, okay? So we're in this amazing race. And the hard part of it is we don't know when it's going to end, right? We don't know how it's going to end. People will compare this to a sprint. It's not. They'll compare it to a marathon or an ultra marathon. It's not because you know when those are going to end. Before my knees gave out, I was a long distance runner for decades and I ran three marathons and um, two Denvers and one San Diego. And you train your body, you train your legs, you train your lungs, but it's mental. You know you have to go 26.2 miles and that point two is a big deal, okay? So you know you have to do that. And the worst one, um, they tell you that you, they can't describe hitting the wall. I thought, oh, I'm not gonna hit the wall, I'm in great shape, you hit the wall, okay? And the worst one was San Diego, because I trained here. I thought I was doing good, training at altitude. Get to San Diego, and the morning of the race, those of you that have been there or lived there know it's that heavy marine layer. Didn't have any experience with that. So at mile six, I hit the wall. All my hydration, all the carb loading, oh, carb loading's a beautiful thing, but all the carb loading, <laughs> everything I had done was gone at mile six. And I had 20.2 miles left. It's all mental. Every step was misery. And sometimes it feels like that in this race here. We can be in those times when it feels like every step is miserable. But look who's at the end waiting for us. Look who's running this amazing race with us. That's what makes it amazing. I love that about Jesus. Jesus is carrying you when you need to be carried. Like we talked about last week, he's holding your hand when you need your hand held. He's got his arm around you. He's leading you like a good shepherd. He's giving you a kick in the butt when you need that because he disciplines those that he loves. Jesus is all around you while you run this race, and then he's at the finish line. So you can run the race with your eyes on Christ, and we're going to talk about that a lot today, or you can join the parade, okay? we got a parade going too, all right? And this parade is on a wide road, a broad road with a wide gate. And where does the parade lead? to destruction. If you're recognizing Jesus' words from the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 7, it leads to destruction. There's a lot of people in that parade. There's a lot of people saying, oh, there's a lot of ways to heaven. There's many ways to heaven. When our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ said, there's one way. Remember, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me, John 14, 6. Those aren't words of a man. Those are the words of our Savior. Those are the words of God who said there's one way. But we've got these people in the parade that say oh, all paths lead to heaven. You've got people in the parade who are living their own truth, who say there's no God. In the parade, there's a lot of emperors with no clothes. Remember when you were a little kid? Remember that story, Hans Christian Andersen? I had to brush up on it a little bit. But the emperor, all he cared about was clothes. It said he had a new coat for every hour. Okay, always. And they, when they talked about the emperor, they didn't say, oh, he's with his men now or he's with his people planning what we're going to do in the kingdom. They always said the emperor is in his dressing room. All he cared about was clothes. 
And then remember what the two swindlers did? They came in and they pretended they were making him this great outfit when actually there was nothing there. So he goes in and he strips down and they said, oh, here, let us put this robe on you. Let us do this, let us do this. The guy's buck naked and he goes out in the parade to show his people, hey, look at me. And the people are fawning over him and flattering. Oh, that's the most beautiful outfit we've ever seen. You look so handsome. That's amazing. The parade is full of emperors with no clothes. And people are shut down when they say anything. Our emperors with no clothes are redefining what God said. What God said. God said, this is the responsibility that man has. God said, this is what a family looks like. God said, this is what marriage looks like. God said, I made them male and female. And our emperors with no clothes are changing it. Are changing it. Just because they say it doesn't make it true. And the little child that pointed out, you know, leans over to mommy and says, the emperor has no clothes. They scoffed at the little kid. But the little kid had it right. You must become just like a child to enter the kingdom of God. Be in the race. Don't be in the parade with all of them. Because wide is the road. Wide is the gate and it leads to destruction. Who's out in front? Satan, the father of lies. That's what Jesus called him. Remember John 8, 44. Satan is out in front of the parade with all the emperors, with all the sheep that are going the wrong way. Get in the race. And when you're in the race, You need to keep your eyes on the author and perfecter of our faith. And if you're going, okay, that's familiar. That's Hebrews 12, 1 through 3. So there's two passages we're going to be concentrating on. I am super holy this morning. Two Bibles open because um, we've got Hebrews 12, 1 through 3, if you want to turn there. And we are also, because it's so parallel, uh, Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 to 14. So I'll let you get there. So you can pick a passage, you can put your finger in one, you can do whatever you want. But we're in Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 to 14, and then Hebrews 12, 1 to 3. I love this. This little boy decided to join the race, even though he didn't truly understand why you're flipping. Wendy Zoba talked about the time when her middle son, Ben, was very young. He'd heard more than one sermon already in Sunday school about how important it was to give your life to Jesus, but he kept resisting. Little guy's four years old, and and, and the other kids would raise their hand and say, yes, I choose Jesus, I choose Jesus. His older sibling had chosen Jesus, but little Ben just was kind of the holdout. And his parents were getting concerned, but he's four, okay, but his parents were like, "I I don't understand. I don't understand why the other kids understand about Jesus and want to give their life to him what's up with Ben? What, what's going on here? And they tried to talk to him, and he just, no, no, not yet. He resisted for several months, and then one morning as they sat around the kitchen table eating their Cheerios, little Ben announced that he was ready to give his life to Christ. Then he got up from the table and went upstairs. Mom and Dad looked at each other and followed him. They expected to find Ben on his knees in prayer. Instead, they found him folding his Star, War, Star Wars pajamas into his Sesame Street suitcase. They said, Ben, what are you doing? He said, packing. Why? They said, to go to heaven, he answered. And then they understood why he hesitated to give his life to Christ. He thought that in so doing, he would leave his family and take up residence, literally, with Jesus Christ in heaven. He thought when he chose Jesus, that meant it's time to go. So he was hesitating. He loved his mommy, his daddy, his big sister. Doesn't look like that, though, does it? We choose Christ, and then we enter the race, this amazing race he has for us. And you know, as you run this race, oh, the places you will go. Okay, we're from Hans Christian Anderson to Dr. Seuss, but oh, the places you will go, it's a life of adventure when you're truly walking with Jesus. Remember we talked last week about walking in the Spirit and your 10,000 steps? And how many of them are you taking with the Spirit? And the choices we have, you can veer over here into this pathway of sin, or you can just march with the Spirit. And sometimes, even while we're marching with the Spirit, we still go off into sin sometimes, and we'll talk about what that looks like. We'll talk about coming back. But Paul used sports analogies a lot. 
okay? He's, he would be the guy, Paul would, with the remote always tuned to ESPN if he was on earth now. Remember, he talked about fighting, just like we saw in 2 Timothy 4, 7, the boxing. He talked about that in 1 Corinthians 9, boxing. You see him in Ephesians 6 when it talks about the armor of God, wrestling. And he talks a lot about running. Running this amazing race with a magnificent ending. And you know what the, the football coaches say is true about our race too. No pain, no gain. No guts, no glory. We are going to be entering into glory with Jesus Christ at the end of our race. The greatest hazard in life is to risk nothing. The woman who risks nothing, does nothing, has nothing, and accomplishes nothing. One of, one of the things I try to live by is try to do something so big that if God's not in it, it fails. Try to do something so big that if God's not in it, you fail. And honest to goodness, I'm not talking about, like, just like what I talked about, we're doing the thousand bags for Reach for Joy. That, that's going to fail if God's not in it. I'm talking about, too, going over to your mean neighbor and being kind. Do something so big that if God's not in it, it's going to fail. I'm talking about humbling yourself and going and apologizing to someone. Someone that's not kind to you. Do something so big that if God's not in it, it's going to fail. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. The words of Jesus, that is our mantra <laughs> for our race. Dr. Palmer Chichen wrote in his book, the book's called New Re er, True Religion. He talks about traveling to the western edge of Zimbabwe to raft the Zambezi River. It's Z-A-M-B-E-Z-I River. They board the raft at the, at the base of the Victoria Falls where massive amounts of water spilled over the top and drop almost 1,000 feet. The roar is deafening as water from the falls rushes down the gorge in torrents, creating the world's largest rapids. Here in the United States, the highest class rapids that you can actually raft are class five. The Zambezi's whitewater rapids top seven and eight in category. That's how fast they're flowing. So Dr. Chinchin sat on the edge of the eight-person raft. He said he was all suited up in a tight overstuffed jacket and a thick crash helmet. He said he felt overcautious, like a tourist about to mount an overpowered moped in Honolulu. The Zambezi can't be that dangerous, can it? But then their guide said when the raft flips, not if it flips, or on the off chance that we get flipped, when the raft flips, Stay in the rough water. You'll be tempted to swim towards the stagnant water at the edge of the banks. Don't do it, because in the stagnant water, the crocodiles are waiting for you. They're large and hungry. Even when the raft flips, stay in the rough water. Even when the race gets rough, keep putting one foot after another with Jesus Christ. Don't take the easy way out. What, does it, what good does it do a, a man if he <laughs> gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Stay in the rough water. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, herself, pick up her cross, and follow me. Hebrews 12.1 it begins with a therefore, which you have to say what it's there for. We'll, we'll talk about that. But therefore, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Let's break that down. Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a cloud of great witnesses, what's he talking about? The chapter before. Hebrews 11 is the Hebrews Hall of Faith. It's where God highlights the people that have lived life's, lives of faith, some of them, not all of them, but it highlights people that won or that live lives of faith. Abraham is mentioned, right? Noah, David, they, all these people are mentioned. Let, let's talk about them for a minute. Noah, Noah got drunk and naked. Abraham lied. Moses had anger issues. And they're in Hebrews' hall of faith that God singles out under inspiration of the Holy Spirit. It's not about perfection. It's about the pursuit. 
And we talked about that when we talked about David before. So your, your race is not going to look perfect, but it's the pursuit. Do you keep running? Do you keep your eyes on Christ while you're running all the time? Not about perfection, but the pursuit. Let us run with endurance the race that's laid out before us. <laughs> it's your race. And your race is different than my race, is different than somebody else's race. It's a unique race that God puts in your life. Don't look around, look at your race. When you start looking around, that's when you can get into trouble. My silly little snowman illustration that a lot of you have heard, but it makes a lot of sense. Two little fellas, first snowstorm of the year. Okay, they're out playing, doing little boy things. They're throwing snowballs at each other. They're making snowmen. They're doing all this. Finally, you know, after 15 minutes, because their little boys are bored, and they say, what should we do now? And so they pick out a tree that's maybe 50 yards away and say, let's make a path to that tree. It was a big old heavy snow. Okay, let's make a path to that tree. Let's see who can walk the straightest. So they both head off to the tree. Well, when they get there, they turn around and look. One path is as straight as can be. The other path is zigging and zagging, going all over the place. And the little fellow that went straight turns to his bud and said, what were you doing? Why is your path zigging and zagging? And he said, well, I was looking to see what you were doing, and I was looking around to see who was watching, and I was looking here, and I was looking there, and that's why he zigged and zagged. Run your race with your eyes on Jesus Christ. Looking around at what others are doing and what their race looks like makes you zig and zag. You don't get there in the same way. And you really don't know. Man looks at the outward appearance. God looks at the heart. That's 1 Samuel 16, 7. I knew two men years ago, close friends with both of them. They worked together. They had been in the same office for decades. And <laughs> I was good friends with each separately, so I, I knew their story separately. And I just remember one complaining to me about the other. You know, he has no problems. He has no health problems. He has no family problems. He doesn't even need to work. They're so well off financially. His life is wonderful compared to mine. And he got bitter about his own race. Well, I knew this other guy too, and I couldn't betray confidences, but I didn't want, so I couldn't say anything, but his health had issues. His family had issues. They had financial issues. But from the outside looking in, we can paint it with such a rosy brush, can't we? That's why just run your race with your eyes on Christ. Run the one that he set before you. And we're going to keep talking about let's finish well. John Stott, I've quoted him before, my favorite John Stott-ism, if you want to call it that, is he said, when there are question marks swirling in your head, why God did you allow this? Why did you do this? Why did this happen? When those question marks are swirling in your brain, stamp crosses over them. Stamp a cross over every question mark. That's my favorite John Stott-ism. Well, when he was dying, he was um, down to his last hour. A man named Oz Guinness was sitting with him. And Oz said, how would you like me to pray for you? Lying weakly on his back and barely able to speak, John Stott answered in a hoarse whisper, pray that I will be faithful to my Jesus until my last breath. Pray that I will be faithful to my Jesus until my last breath. That's running the race well. And that's what a Christian giant like John Stott wanted. So how do we do that? How do we remain faithful until our last breath? How do we run with endurance the race that he laid out for us? We learn from the witnesses of the past. Not perfect, but constant pursuit. Going hard after God. God kept working with them through their sin. In the race, we mutter and sputter. We fume and we spurt. We mumble and grumble. Our feelings get hurt. We can't understand things. Our vision grows dim when all that we need is a moment with him. Just keep checking in with your Jesus during the race. <laughs> the Lord wants your precious time, not your spare time. Jesus wants your precious time, not your spare time. Over to the Philippians passage, Paul's saying, not that I've attained all this, he's talking about the righteousness of Christ, or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that which Christ Jesus took hold of me. I don't consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, 
I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Focus, laser focus. They're both talking about the same thing. Eyes on Christ, going hard after him. The things that hinder us are in both passages, the Hebrews 12 and, and Philippians 3. The things that hinder us. You know what? We'll talk about sin. That hinders us. But sometimes the things that hinder us, they're good things too. Things that we would call good. They're not bad. Hobbies, pleasures, pursuits, not bad things. But what priority, what precedence do you give them? How much of your time do you put into them? When we do that, a good thing can become a bad thing. Social media. It, it can be so many different ways. Some people use Facebook to keep up with their families and see pictures of their families and everything. But if you spend hours a day on Facebook, it most certainly could go from a quick little good thing to a bad thing, couldn't it? All kinds of ways like that. Social media can be so damaging in so many ways. But it started out with a good thing. Just staying connected with my family. You've just constantly got to be in this evaluation process. As you run the race, evaluate. Okay, and it's not hard. You look at your time. Like I just said, how much time do you spend on different things? Look at your calendar. Where are you putting your time? Look at your checkbook or your credit card statement. Where am I putting my money? Treasure, what gifts do you have? Where are you using them? Okay, it's just a continual evaluation why we're running the race. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added in, unto you. Just the constant evaluation as we're running this race. Spending so much time in ministry that you don't even bother praying anymore. Okay, that was a good thing that we allowed to become a bad thing. <laughs> so many activities that you're spread so thin that you don't spend any time with the Lord who you profess to have first in your life. Okay, it's just this constant evaluation. We need to have time to fellowship with the Lord. That needs to be the main thing. Okay, D.L. Moody said he had an hour appointment every day, the most impo important appointment with God. He just sat every day and prayed and sat and listened for answers every day. He said that's the most important um, relationship I have. And speaking of relationships, I just said you need to evaluate time, talent, treasure. You need to evaluate your relationships occasionally too. Some of us get sucked into that as Christians. We think we have to be everything to everybody. And when we do that, you're not being what God wants you to be. When you think you have to be everything to everybody, how is that leaving you time to just serve him and to spend with him, okay? It starts out with a good heart, and then Satan perverts it. You are not meant to be everything to everybody. You need to think of your relationships, and this is going to sound harsh, okay, a little bit, but you take it or not and just do some praying later as you evaluate your relationships. And if there's any truth to this, ask the Lord to show you and ask him to show you if there's something you need to fix. But I think you need to look at relationships too. I know I do, like a bank account, okay? Think about your bank account. The paycheck comes in or whatever source, the money comes in and fills it up, and then the money goes out, right? You pay your bills, you do things like that. So you, you under, we all understand balance and our bank accounts. We have relationships which fill us up and we have relationships which drain us. What does your balance look like? If it's all the drain, how are you functioning? How are you living your best for Christ when you're constantly drained? We need to evaluate our relationships. You spend time with someone, when you walk away, how do you feel? Do you feel encouraged? Do you, did you have prayer time with that person? Do you feel encouraged? Do you feel like the runner who's just been at the aid station? and gotten filled back up, and rehydrated, and oh man, I feel so refreshed after spending time with her. How about the drain? The people that when they see you, here comes the garbage truck, and they dump their garbage all over you. Let's just be honest, the verbal vomit, okay? Ver boom, and then they walk away feeling a little bit better. You don't. If that's all you got, you're in trouble. You're in trouble. You've got to keep that balance right and ask the Lord to show you. Ask him to show you. Does that mean you may have to move away from some people? Absolutely. Absolutely. I've moved away from several people to keep my walk with Christ right. We pray for those people that are the constant drain, but you know what? I hate to say it, but you're not all that because they'll just go find somebody else to dump their garbage on 
okay, and verbal vomit on, okay? So you just keep your eyes on Christ, and you evaluate everything through him. Check your balance sheet. You're going, Kara, is that biblical? Yes, ma'am, it is. Okay, Paul. Paul, he labeled, he categorized. Look at the end of 2 Timothy, uh, the, the letter of 2 Timothy chapter 4 later. He named him. He said, Demas went back to the world. He said, Alexander did harm to me. And you know what he said then? He goes, God's going to get him. That's Paul. 2 Timothy 4, check me later. Okay, check me later. All right, it's okay to categorize and label. You pray for them, but you see them for what you are. If you go to the end of other letters of Paul, he says, this guy helped me. He was a faithful laborer. This happened, that happened. He calls it, he calls a spade a spade. Okay, I don't think they had playing cards then yet or whatever, but he called a spade a spade. All right, that's what we have to do too, prayerfully, with the Lord at our side. Help me to see it. And if you look at the progression, Demas, he mentioned him in Colossians. He mentioned him in Philemon as a fellow worker, as someone helping him. And then in 2 Timothy 4, he goes, but he went back to the world. Okay, Paul called it the way he saw it. It is okay to do that. But prayerfully asking the Lord for wisdom and discernment, okay? And if any of you say, Kara told me to dump my best friend, I did not, <laughs> okay? I did not. You don't go up and I said, well, you verbally vomit on me all the time and I heard in Bible study we're done. I didn't say that. <laughs> prayerfully, prayerfully consider your relationships because we need to live intentionally. We need to run our race, our amazing race, intentionally and you need those aid stations. You need those people that you're just, thank you, an hour with you helps keep me going. I love watching your joy in the Lord. I love hearing your testimony. They're just the people that just are like a shot in the arm, not the black hole people. Set boundaries. Do periodic checkups. Do periodic checkups of what material stuff's important to you. Okay? Do periodic checkups. We remember during all the fires, we had the different people that evacuated coming in and Reach for Joy, we were helping at the shelters and doing different things. But Elaine and I went down to the, the Gardnerville Walmart um, because there were a lot of people in the parking lot. And Pastor Rich said, they can go invite them. They can come stay in our parking lot. We don't have a lot, but we got a garden hose. They could have water and they could come to church. We thought it was a good idea. So Elaine and I go down there and we split up. And I went and talked to these people and I said, would you like to come to our parking lot? And he said, do you think you got enough room? I looked at him. Two big SUVs. One pulled this huge boat. Another one had this trailer with a couple quads and all this other stuff. And he was serious. Do you think your church parking lot can handle all our stuff? And it didn't really hit me until I was working on this lesson. These people were fleeing the flames. They were leaving the fire. And look what they thought was important. And, and think about how slowly they got over the mountains with all that stuff. Okay? the boat and the quads and the this and the that, and they were like kind of proud of it. Do you think you can handle all our stuff? I'm thinking, we really don't want to, but I didn't say that. <laughs> but same thing, there's this guy I see when I go out on my walks, and seriously, he's got these two beautiful black luxury cars, and black's a high maintenance color though, isn't it, right, on a vehicle? So I see him, he pulls them out, he washes and waxes them, and puts them back. I think I've seen him drive them twice, but I, so many times he pulls them out, washes and waxes, and puts them back. What, does he own his stuff, or does his stuff own him? Okay, now I know these were extreme examples, but again, we need to pray. Lord, there's nothing wrong with having a black SUV. Not saying that. There's nothing wrong with having a boat or a quad. Diana's got three quads. She's zipping around all the time. Not saying those are bad things, okay? But do you own your stuff? Or does your stuff own you? And just get that picture in your head of people fleeing the fire with all their stuff. They're in the parade. They ain't in the race. You can't race with all that stuff, right? Think about how people dress for the race. Think about the Olympians. They get the lightest weight clothing they can possibly get. The shoes that are designed now, it's like, like slipper socks almost. They're so light. They dress light. They don't carry their stuff behind them as they run to win the race. Just a thought. The stuff that slows us down. Alistair Begg had a great example. He and a guy named Dr. Hall, they went over to Nairobi 
to uh, talk to missionaries over there that were fly, getting ready to fly around and, and distribute medical supplies. He said they visited the hangars where the airplanes were. They kept the airplanes there that were going on the missionary trips. He said the planes looked the same from the outside, but when you open the door, inside was totally stripped down. He said they arrived nicely upholstered, seats, everything. They took all the upholstery off. They took out the padding along the sides of the doors. The dashboard, they took off all the wood paneling. No extraneous piece of material was left in the plane. Why? Missionaries, it's, it's, there's not a chapter and verse that says missionaries are not allowed to be comfortable. You are not allowed to be comfortable as you serve the Lord. It doesn't say that. They had to take out what was weighing them down so that they could make their mission. So they could get the supplies to the farthest flung places. So they stripped down everything that was unnecessary on the inside of the plane. Luxury seating wasn't wrong, but it wasn't the best. Same thing as we run our race. This is, was Alistair Begg's final comment on that. He said, every earthly pursuit, however innocent in itself, when it interferes with our Christian pursuit, becomes a weight that must be put aside. Exactly what he's saying in Hebrews. Exactly what he's saying in Philippians. Lay aside every weight. I didn't know this. You may have. I, I've said before that you are not God's white elephant gift. Okay, God didn't get stuck with you. Okay, God chose you from before the foundation of the world. He didn't go, oh my gosh, I got to take this one. It wasn't like that. We're all going to go to Christmas stuff and there's going to be white elephant gifts and you are not that. Okay, but did you know where white elephant gift came from? Just say no because I did not and I'm going to tell you. Thank you. In ancient days when the king of Siam, it's S-I-A-M, had an enemy that he wanted to torment and destroy, he would send that enemy a unique gift, a white elephant, a live albino elephant. These animals were considered sacred in the culture of the day. So the recipient of that elephant had no choice but to intentionally care, intentionally care for the gift. This elephant would take an inordinate amount of time Resources, energy, emotions, and finances. Over time, the enemy would destroy himself because of the extremely burdensome process of caring for the gift. Don't let yourself get entangled. The enemy, Satan, wants to entangle you. He wants to trip you up. Satan wants to keep your shoes untied. Okay? Don't get entangled. Lay aside every sin. Sin which clings so closely, it says in verse 1. Lay aside the sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the sin or the race sent before us. We all sin. If we say we don't, we're liars. 1 John 1 8. So when we do sin, we confess and we repent. And because God is holy and just, he forgives us. Just, just look at the proximity John put that in. He said, If you say you don't sin, you're a liar. But here's this God that forgives sin if you just ask because he's faithful and just. So when we get entangled, we ask for forgiveness. This is also talking about, in Greek, this verse, Hebrews 12, verse 1, it says, and sin which entangles so closely, the sin in Greek. There's a definite article. So he's talking about a specific sin, the sin that entangles us. There's two ways to look at that. The first one, eh, I, I think you got to look at the language more closely. We all have a besetting sin. Okay, everybody, it's like the dog that returns to his vomit. We all have something, our one thing, whether our besetting sin is being envious or whether it's lying or whether it's pride. Whatever that looks like, we all have something that we go back to. Okay, even when we've come to know Christ as Lord and Savior, just this is what we go back into when we have our sinful times, if you want to look at it like that. That's one way of looking at that. I've heard it taught that way. But when you look at Greek and you look at the context of the whole passage, when it says, and sin which so closely, which entangles us, the sin, when you look in context, he's talking about faith. So the sin that can entangle us is unbelief. Okay, when you look in context, we just talked about Hebrews Hall of Faith was all of chapter 11, and now he's talking about the sin which can entangle us, unbelief. And I think contextually that makes more sense than the first explanation, but I just wanted to present them both because we need to work on both of them. We all have a besetting sin and we need to work on our faith. 
by keeping our eyes on Jesus and watching everything he does and your faith will go. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Okay, so that's what we're doing right now. Our faith is growing by talking about God's word and look at what he's doing. So let's stay free of our entanglements. Look at the winner himself. Eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, the one who ran the perfect, sinless race. Jesus ran the best race that's ever been run. Perfect, sinless. Died on the cross, rose again to bring us all to him. Your past, Philippians 3.13, it says forgetting what lies behind. You can't do anything to change it. You can't do anything to change it. And if you have confessed and repented, and repentance is turning and going in the other direction, that's what it's talking about, forgetting what is behind. It made you who you are if you built a testimony. Look what God took me from, okay? But the past is the past. I look at it as Humpty Dumpty theology, okay? Humpty Dumpty theology. Let's go back to Genesis with that. Just think about that silly little nursery rhyme. Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't, couldn't put Humpty together again. It goes right back to the garden. When Adam and Eve believed the fruit salesman and ate the fruit, Humpty Dumpty fell off the wall. Okay, they lost their perfect fellowship with God in the garden. They couldn't put it back together. Think about all the king's horses and all the king's men. Horses were a sign of power and authority and influence in the Old Testament times. Horses were all that. If you had horses, you were, you were there. You were good, you were powerful, you were a ruler. But all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty together again. There was nothing people could do. So God gave the solution. You can't fix it. I can and we see right in Genesis 3.15, he promises us a savior who's going to crush the head of Satan. Okay? He said, he'll bruise your heel. He will bruise the savior's heel, but the savior will crush his head. Here comes Jesus Christ. Okay? That was God's solution. Jesus Christ, our savior, to when Humpty Dumpty fell off the wall in the Garden of Eden. It applies to your life, too. Your past is your past. Okay? There are things that have been broken in our past that we cannot fix. There is sin that we cannot take away. We can't do anything about our own sin. We committed it, but we can't do anything about it. But God fixed it. God put Humpty together again through Jesus Christ. So it goes down again to the most basic level. Okay, You can't fix it, but God did. He gave us a Savior. Confess and repent and press on. You must become just like a child. Are you a one-thing person? Are you a one-thing person? And I'm going to give you some examples. Or are you hindered or, ent or entangled? We need to be one-thing people in this amazing race. One thing is a really important biblical phrase. Have you thought about it? Think about all the different places we see it. I'll give you the uh, references so you can look them up later. Mark 10, remember the rich young ruler who came to Jesus? And he's, he's rich, he's young, he's a ruler, he's, he's all that. And he comes to Jesus and, and Jesus says, one thing you lack. Go sell your stuff and come follow me. One thing. He didn't have the laser focus on Jesus Christ. He, was, he went away sad because he had great possessions, it said. He wasn't a one thing person. His eyes were distracted by his stuff. One thing you lack. Martha and Mary. Remember? Martha Stewart's running around getting the meal and everything and, and Mary's at the feet of Christ and Martha tells on Mary because that's what sisters do. And so, you know, Lord, aren't you going to tell her to help me? And he said, Martha, you're worried and distracted about so many things. There's one thing that's important and Mary has chosen that, being at the feet of Christ. That's in Luke 10, Luke 10, 42. One thing is needed and Mary has chosen that. She was a one thing person. The blind guy that Jesus healed in John chapter 9. You know, that they're, they're testing him and they're trying to get him to accuse Jesus of doing something and they're going through all this stuff and what, did you do this? Did he say that? What did, who is he? What did he do? And the blind guy says, I don't know, but the one thing I know is I was blind and now I see. That should be the one thing that all of us know 
We were blind. We were dead women walking, right, in our sins and trespasses. Ephesians 2.1, we were dead women walking, but we can say, but one thing I know, I was blind, and now I see. Eyes open, running the race. David, in Psalm 27.4, talked about David a lot. Passionate pursuit. David, one thing I have desired of the Lord, and I will seek after. He was a one-thing person. Nehemiah. Read the book of Nehemiah sometime. It is so amazing. He was a one-thing guy. One-thing guy. And remember what happened to him? God sent him. He said, go build the wall. Go build, rebuild the wall around Jerusalem. So Nehemiah goes out of obedience, right? He goes to rebuild. He's doing his one thing. He was threatened. He was ridiculed. He was scoffed. My favorite part, because I don't think this is rudeness in Nehemiah 6. Nehemiah 6, oh, maybe it's rude, but I liked it. Okay, but Nehemiah 6, verses 3 to 4, the enemies say, we want to meet with you. They send him a message. Not once. Not twice, not three times, not four times. The enemies want to distract him, so they say, we want to meet with you. And Nehemiah's response, why would I meet with you? I have a job to do. One thing person, Nehemiah. And again, look at how when we talked about relationships, look at his focus. The enemies want time for him. They keep asking and asking and asking. He doesn't go, well... I'm a man of God, I gotta go be nice. I know God gave me a job, but you know, they've asked me four times. Why would I meet with you? God gave me a job to do. Now clean that up with people, but that, okay? <laughs> Stay focused on what God has given you to do as you run your race. And make sure you're going in the right direction. Make sure you're going in the right direction. Eyes on Christ, going towards him. This I got to be honest, this illustration, I loved it, so I'm going to share it, but it scared me because this could be me. Maybe it could be you. There was a lady named, she's a Belgian woman, 67 years old. Her name was Sabine, S-A-B-I-N-E, Moreau. She was driving to Brussels, Belgium, which was 90 miles away from her home, to pick up her friend, okay? 90 miles away to pick up her friend. She entered the GPS coordinates in her little, in her little unit, and then she drove and drove and drove all the way to Croatia, it was a 1,000 miles away. She crossed five international borders. She stopped for gas. She stopped to rest. She stopped for gas again. A 1,000 miles. She meant to go 90. She drove and drove and drove. And then she gets to Croatia, the capital, Zagreb, and she thought, I think I should turn around. <laughs> She'd been going a long time in the wrong direction. And so I love this. This is Skip Isaac. He goes, so you need to make sure you're traveling on the right road in the right direction, okay? 90-mile journey, 1,000 miles later. I think I need to turn around, okay? That's way worse than us going to the garage and going, why am I here, right? <laughs> Come on. But check where you're going. That's why I'm talking about these periodic evaluations. After the second time getting gas, wouldn't you have clued in? that it's probably been longer than 90 miles? Make sure you're going in the right direction. Isn't that scary? Ooh. <laughs> Don't let anybody stop you. Don't let anybody stop you. I use the Nehemiah example, you know, and, and you're going, okay, yeah, that was a long time ago. Let's, let's look at some Christian evangelists that we've heard of. D.L. Moody. D.L. Moody, okay, what he did in the late 1800s, he's leading hundreds of people to Christ. And as a result, he received a lot of criticism, not just from his enemies, but from fellow pastors too, who were jealous. They were jealous of his success. One of them reamed him out for the way he invited people to come forward at his services. Remember, Billy Graham did the same thing. D.L. Moody would invite people to come forward to accept Christ, Moody listened patiently and then replied, okay, I agree with you, brother. I, altogether, I don't altogether like the method myself, and I'm always looking for a better one. Look at the humble, humility there. He goes, what's your, what's your method? What do you do? The man was dumbfounded. He had no method for inviting people to trust Christ, but he's going to criticize the guy who did. Okay, let's go across the ocean because the enemy uses the same tactics. He used people to criticize Nehemiah. He used people to criticize D.L. Moody, Spurgeon. Spurgeon did it a different way. He's in London. Unlike Moody, he didn't invite people to come forward. He invited them to come to his office later in the week if they had any questions. He led dozens of people to Jesus every week, and his church grew from 80 
to 6,000 people in seven years. From 80 to 6,000 by inviting them. Do you think the pastors in London were thrilled? They were jealous. They wrote editorials against him in the papers calling him vulgar and theatrical, an insult to God and man. Okay? You're going to get criticized as you run the race. Really, that's a good sign. If people are criticizing you, you're doing something right. Don't let their jealousy stop you. Don't get entangled in what people are saying. Like we said, Jesus ran the perfect race, Hebrews 12.2, and he blazed the way to the top. It's not a sprint. It's not a marathon. It's not an ultra marathon. But I really like this guy who did this because he didn't listen to anybody else. He just went and did it. True story, Melbourne, Australia, ultra marathon, 1983, 150 world-class athletes converge on Sydney, Australia to start the race. They're in incredible shape. They've got their gear on. You're going to look at them, and they're ready to go. 543.7 miles. 543.7 miles is what it was. Up then walks this 61-year-old toothless potato farmer. He was a shepherd potato potato farmer, 61 years old with no teeth. It was so cute. I read a quote by him. The reason he ran with no teeth was because they rattled when he ran. (laughs) So he took them out. You got to love the honesty. So here he is, 61-year-old potato farmer, no teeth, overalls, galoshes over his work boots. And he comes walking up and people think, okay, maybe he's a local guy here to watch the race. But no, he wants to run the race. So he walks up to the table. He demands a number. They look at him like, you got to be kidding. You won't make it a mile. They give him number 64, and the gun goes off. His name, like I said, true story, Cliff Young. Here's the backstory. He grew up on a farm, a 2,000-acre farm, and was in charge as a young guy of watching and keeping 2,000 sheep sheep in check. 2,000 sheep on 2,000 acres. On that farm, they didn't have quads. They didn't have four-wheel drive vehicles. They didn't even have horses. So when the storms came in, Cliff would go out there to run and herd the sheep. It sometimes took him two or three days of running around to get all the sheep. Look at how God trains us for what we have ahead. Look at how he trains us. And we just keep pressing towards what's in front. So the race begins. Cliff Young starts the race. The gun goes off. And when he begins, everybody starts laughing because this is how they described it. He looked like he had this odd shuffle, but he was really running. So there he is running 500 miles in galoshes over his work boots. This odd shuffle. Five days, 15 hours, and four minutes later, he won. He didn't win by a few seconds. He didn't win by a few minutes. He beat the nearest runner by nine hours and 56 minutes. Almost 10 hours. It says, pray tell, how did he win this race? Well, to run this ultra marathon, the runners, what they did, they'd run 18 hours and sleep for six. Run 18, sleep for six. Cliff didn't sleep. He just ran his race. He just ran his race that he had been prepared in advance to run. You can sleep. That's not the message here, okay? But those things in our past that we can't change, God can use those as we run this amazing race. The direction of your gaze, eyes on Christ, the one thing person, depend on his grace. 2 Corinthians 12.9, remember? We're using the Greek word order again, 2 Corinthians 12.9. Sufficient for you is the grace of me. That's what Jesus told Paul. Sufficient for you is the grace of me. 2 Corinthians 12.9. And when you fall, just keep getting back up. Jesus will help pick you up if you ask him. When you fall, just keep getting back up. Do the things that God has put before you. There was this Calvin and Hobbes cartoon. And Calvin turns to Hobbes and said, God put me on earth to accomplish a certain number of things. Right now I'm so far behind I'll never die. Okay? (laughs) If you feel like that, reevaluate. Okay? Do your little reevaluation checklist we've been talking about. Okay? But just don't forget for a second who's running with you. The end is coming. Okay? Whether it's our natural death, whether it's the rapture of the church, the end is coming. And and that's why we're just going to finish up today looking at Matthew 24 a little bit. Uh, If you did the Revelation study, that was the very first lesson we did because I wanted to look at what Jesus had to say about the end. 
And what Jesus had to say about the end is no one knows when the, time, when the end is coming. No one knows the time or date. That was Matthew 24, 36, the words of Christ. But concerning that day and, and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven nor the Son, but only the Father, Matthew 24, 36. I've always thought, and I'm sure you've seen them too, the people that predict when the world's going to end, they give you the day and the year. Really, the only thing you can be sure of is it won't be that day and it won't be that year, <laughs> right? Because Jesus said no one knows. So when they go putting a date, so we need to live in constant expectancy. Constant expectancy. You get up in the morning, <laughs> this, is, this, is today the day, Lord? Is today the day, Lord? And honest to goodness, if today's the day, what do you want Jesus to catch you thinking about when he comes back? What do you want Jesus to catch you looking at when he comes back? What do you want him to catch you doing when he comes back? If we always keep that at the forefront, it makes our race better. If Jesus came back today, what's he going to find me doing, thinking, saying? We wait for his coming with constant expectancy. You, I, I, I asked uh, Cindy, she had heard of this. I never had. Do you know that even unbelievers are looking at the signs now and know that something's coming? Even unbelievers are starting to get nervous. Look, look this up when you get a chance. It's Vivos, V-I-V-O-S. V-I-V-O-S. I went on their website and looked. This is what it's described as. People are sensing that a global, life-changing event is just ahead. Millions of people believe we're living in the end times. The governments of the world know something and have bunkering, been bunkering up for decades. Why is nobody telling you to prepare? Obviously, to avoid mass panic. What is your plan? Will your family be victors or survivors? This Vivos company is building bunkers all over the world for people to go through to when the catastrophe happens. Okay, there's 575 in, this, in South Dakota, in the Black Hills. They built 575 of these underground bunkers. Go and look at the website after. They are the most beautiful things. Granite countertops, leather recliners. They got pools down there. Yeah, that, that's, that's where, because there's this catastrophic, catastrophic event coming. Okay, so they're going to go live in luxury. It even says on there, you can be sustained down here for a year. I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed, but I thought even if they could get there for the first year of the tribulation when they come up, they got six left. Okay, but we're going to be in heaven. We don't have to worry. If you buy one of these things, come tell me so I can personally kick your tail, okay? But <laughs> I'm serious. Even unbelievers are sensing this, that something's going on, and we got to have a plan, and they're staying in the parade. They're still over here in the parade instead of getting in the race with their eyes on Jesus Christ. And the, the cool thing about Jesus is you can ask to get in the race at any time. Jesus, I am so sorry. I am a sinner. I accept your sacrifice on my behalf. I want to run with you. I want you waiting for me at the finish line. I want you walking with me the whole way. That's all they have to do. Instead, they're over here in the parade with all the emperors with no clothes, living their own truth, doing all the weird stuff, okay, and buying this Vivos thing. It's 35000 a person <laughs> to go there so you might make it for a year. Okay, come on. But yet they are sensing it too. That was the wake-up thing for me. They know something's coming, but they're not taking the right steps. They're shelling out their money to this company. That website I was telling you about says that half or more of the U.S. population will be dead within a year from the anarchy following a major catastrophic event. You need to arrive before the facility is locked down and secured from the chaos above. We're going to be above having a party, but okay. It even reminds you it wasn't raining when Noah built the ark. Okay? Look what Jesus said. In the end times, people are going to be eating and drinking and marrying, be, marrying and being married just like in the days of Noah. They're playing off of what Jesus said. Obviously, they know. And you know one of the saddest things, I remember when I taught Genesis, the saddest thing to me about the Noah and the ark story, it, it hadn't even rained when Noah was building that ark. He built it out of faith. That's why he's in Hebrews 11. Hebrews Hall of Faith, God's Hall of Faith. Wasn't even raining yet. He's building an ark, and they're saying, why are you doing that? Well, you know, because of the flood. What's a flood? Well, it rains a lot. What's rain? Okay, but he just kept going. Noah just kept going. 
nail after nail after nail. And the saddest thing is when the rains came and the people went, oh. And then the floods came and they went, oh. How many claw marks were on the door of the ark on the outside? How many claw marks? Because remember, Noah didn't shut the door. Who shut the door? God did. Scripture said God shut the door. They had their chance. They didn't take it. They scoffed. And God shut the door. How many claw marks were on the outside of that door? The tribulation is going to give them seven more years to turn it around. And many, 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 many are going to come to Christ, which is such an amazing thing. Multitudes that can't even be counted are going to come to Christ during the tribulation. But again, we're going to be in heaven with Jesus Christ, the author and perfecter of our faith, the one who's been waiting for us at the end of the race. 1 Thessalonians 4, the Lord himself will descend with the, from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first, and then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, so we will always be with the Lord. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17, you know that verse. That's a good one to, to uh, go back and look at when the race gets hard, isn't it? Your king is coming for you, and he's going to bring you to meet him in the air. Matthew 24, verse 42 to 43, the words of Christ, Therefore stay awake. You don't know on what day your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Constant expectancy like we've been talking about. Matthew 24, verses 42 to 43. While you're waiting, serve other people. Share Christ with other people. When you serve people, let them know you're doing it because you love Jesus. It's not a hard thing to say. When people, why are you doing this? Because I love Jesus, and I want you to come to know him too. It's such an easy reason to give. I hope you get lots of why are you doing this, because I love Jesus. Dr. Scott Kersman, chief of surgery at Waterbury Hospital in Connecticut, was on his way to deliver an 8 o'clock lecture one morning at a medical school. He witnessed one of the worst crashes in the state's history. A dump truck whose vehicle had lost control flipped on its side, skidded into oncoming traffic. The resulting accident involved 20 vehicles and four people died. Thanks to years of emergency room experience, Dr. Kurtzman immediately shifted into trauma mode. He worked his way through the mangled mess of people and metal calling out, who needs help? After about 90 minutes, when all 16 victims had been triaged and taken to area hospitals, Dr. Kurtzman climbed back in his car drove to the medical school, and gave the lecture two hours late. This kind of thing is typical for Dr. Kurtzman. He says, a person with my skills can't simply drive by someone who is injured. I refuse to live my life that way. We shouldn't be driving by the carnage around us either. We need to be out serving and loving in the name of Christ so that we bring more people into the race with us as we finish up. Keep your hope in God. You know, at the end of all our striving, at the end of our race, we're not going to see a force. We're going to see a face. At the end of all your striving, at the end of all your longing, at the end of all your running, at the end of all your fighting, you're not going to see a force. You're going to see a face. The face of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Imagine his eyes when he looks at you. <laughs> My daughter, I am so glad to see you. I am so glad you're here. You do know that I'm the one that loved you best. You do know that I was with you every minute and that you mean everything to me. And I proved that when I got on the cross. I showed that you mean everything to me. They're not words. And now you're with me forever. Not a force, but a face at the end of your race. Run it well so you're hearing, well done, good and faithful servant. We don't want to go skidding in like we're sliding into home. We want him to look at us, well done and faithful servant. Serve people. Tell people about him. And when the race gets tough, just keep reaching out to him. Just keep reaching out to him as you're running and things are hard. Jan, true story, young mother, lived in Beaver Falls, Pennsylvania. This is her story. She wrote this to her pastor. 
She said it was the end. I knew it. I could no longer fight. I could no longer run the race. I sat here emotionless, emotionless. I was totally alone. Others had tried to help, doctors, nurses, parents, husbands, children, but they were gone. Hours earlier, I had come into the hospital on an emergency basis. I had back pain so severe that at times it dropped me to my knees. This was not my first hospital stay. I'd been sick for a long time, it seemed, as I sat in the bathroom. It was the middle of the night. There were no people, no miracle medicine, no strength left. I was too tired to fight. I sat there, four walls surrounding me, and a bleak, monotonous bleep from my battery-operated IV filled the silence. I couldn't stop the sound of the miserable machine any more than I could control my own miserable life. So I sat there, dull, miserable, in pain, with no hope. Then I heard something else. I didn't hear it with my ears, but I heard it in my spirit. I heard someone crying, and I immediately knew it was Jesus crying for me. I was shocked, totally surprised. I didn't think he would do that for me. This experience did not leave me emotionally elated, nor did I feel a physical touch. Life was the same, except I really now knew that I was not in this battle. I was not in this race alone. Jesus cared in a way my wildest imagination would never have hoped for or expected. Slowly I got up, shuffled back to bed, my IV still beeping in my ears. Life was the same, but entirely different. When there was absolutely no one else that would help me, he cried for me. That's who's in this race with you. That's who's going over the potholes with you. That's who's in the tough spots with you. Be faithful to the end. This is a really awesome prayer. We're going to close with it. Dr. Robertson McQuillan, this is his prayer. It's sundown, Lord. The shadows of my life stretch back into the dimness of the years long spent. I fear not death, for that grim foe betrays himself at last, thrusting me forever into life, life with you, unsoiled and free. But I do fear. I fear the dark specter may come too soon, or do I mean too late, that I should end before I finish, or finish but not well, that I should stain your honor, shame your name, grieve your loving heart, Few, they tell me, finish well. Lord, let me get back home before dark. The darkness of a spirit grown mean and small, fruit shriveled on the vine, bitter to the taste of my companions, burdened to be borne by those brave few who still love me. No, Lord, let the fruit grow lush and sweet, a joy to all who taste, spirit sign of God at work, stronger, fuller, brighter at the end. Lord, let me get home before dark. The darkness of tattered gifts, rust locked, half spent or ill spent, a life that once was used of God and now set aside, gazing on the faded banners of victories long ago, can I not run well until the end? Lord, let me get home before dark. Let's just all ask Jesus to help us run well to the end and get home before dark. Let's pray. Jesus, you are just amazing. You are beyond awesome beyond magnificent. Jesus, you are love personified. You are love come down for the likes of us. Lord, I thank you for the way you've revealed yourself to us in this study that we've been blessed to do together. Father, I pray that every single one of us walks out determined to run our race in a way that's more glorifying and honoring to you. Lord, if there's sin entangling us, if there's baggage that we need to let go, I, I pray that we'll prayerfully come before you and ask you to reveal that to us. You want us to run our race well. Jesus, thank you for showing us through that young lady that you cry with us during the race. Thank you for always picking us up, dusting us off, and helping us keep going. Jesus, I am so thankful that when we cross that finish line, you're going to be there. Lord, I ask your blessing on every lady. Please bless her mind and her body and her heart. Please bless her family and her friends and her study time and her travel time. And Lord, I just pray there are many, many, many sweet, precious moments with you during the race. In your precious name, amen.